Super. So thank you very much indeed uh, for, to all of you for joining us. Um, and I'm now going to hand the floor directly to Sebastián Villasante. Sebastián, the floor is yours. I think you're on mute, Sebastián. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Alice. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you. Uh, thanks a lot for, for giving us the, the opportunity to share with you thumbs up about the the, the scientific evidence about harmful fisheries uh, subsidize. Uh, I would like to uh, to share uh, one one of the key results uh, that we have been recently um, uh, published and shared with the scientific community. Um, more than five, uh, we 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 signed we signed the letter around 300 um, scientists around the world. But right now we are more than 500 um, scientists around the world who are so also supporting this, this letter that we publish in science. We are from uh, 48 countries around six continents. We have been recently calling this paper published in science for the removal or redirecting of harmful subsidies. Why? Uh, because uh, um, sustainable manners while fisheries support food and nutritional security, life holes and also cultures around the world. Uh, however, harmful sub fisheries subsidies undermine these benefits and yet they are increasing globally over time. And science also demonstrates that harmful fisheries subsidies have historically contributed to fleet overcapacity and continue to be allocated to the fishing industry to artificially maintain its profitability, the profitability of the fishery sector. Just to give you a small but very important numbers. Estimates, recent estimates show that around two, uh, $22.5 billion US dollars of global fishery subsidies has been provided in 2019, for which 80% has been allocated to large scale fishery vessels, which are operating not only in their own exclusive economic zone, but also in the high sea and most importantly in uh, the E zone of foreign countries, especially in developing countries. And apart from that, only 20% of this subsidized in 2018 went to the small scale fishery sector, especially in developing countries. And I would like to share this. Uh, this um, this evidence that we have fishery science and economics are really clear the, the evidence is robust large and uh, and clear economic activities such as fisheries largely depend on healthy oceans and if we do not have fish in the oceans we will not be able to have fishers and jobs and revenues will be lost over time um, this time is particularly relevant uh, for the for the scientific community and for the societies as a whole why? Because uh, concerted intention, international effort to formally discipline um, fisheries subsidies has been unfortunately carried out for more than 20 years since 2001. If we really want to have sustainable and equitably fisheries by achieving United Sustainable Development Goals, like uh, Sustainable Development Goals number or for, uh, 14, live water in the oceans, or 13, mitigate to climate change impact, and also reduce inequalities and poverty around the world, we have a true chance here to achieve an agreement which satisfies not only the fishery sector, but also this, the, uh, the societal demands globally. And also we think that uh, subsidized, as I previously stated, according to the scientific evidence we have, um, subsidized to distant water fishing fleet uh, should be also eliminated to avoid overfishing, not only in high sea, but also in other EEC countries uh, where distant water fleets operate. And such sub subsidies has been already threatened low income countries that rely on fish for food security. And redirecting the vast sums of this public money currently being used to potentially support overfishing, for example, toward better management and enforcement will be a, a step in the right direction for current and next generations. Uh, in this science letter that we think uh, uh, around the world, we call on the not only on the head of the states of the high level panel for sustainable ocean economy, the comprehensive and progressive agreement from trans Pacific partnership, the United States, Mexico and Canada agreement who have already committed to re remove harmful subsidies, as well as other trade blocks and individual countries to support 
now for an agreement that enshrines these recommendations. With these negotiations, uh, W2 members are able to really take advantage of this unique opportunity to lead a global positive transformative change while also supporting developing nations to truly achieve sustainable and equitable fisheries. Thank you very much. That's super, Sebastian. Thank you very much indeed. Um, I, I mean, I'm, I'm struck by the fact that it's now over 500 scientists and the map, I think, demonstrates really clearly how broadly that, that the, how broadly the scientific community speaks with this letter, right? It's, it's not just European and North American scientists. It's many from Africa, from Southeast Asia, from Latin America, I saw some from the Pacific, um, you know, many from Northeast Asia as well, which is interesting. Um, and Northwest Asia. So there's, you know, it's fantastic to see the breadth of science. And as you were saying, the, the robust evidence that we have that many of these subsidies need to be reformed in order to ensure the sustainability of the ocean. So thank you very much for presenting that. And I encourage everyone to, to have a look at the letter if you haven't already seen it. Um, so the science, I guess, has spoken. Um, I, uh, but of course, in this, I mean, at the end of the day, we're talking about an industrial policy tool, right? Um, and industrial policy works within the context of markets. And I'd be really interested to hear, Tom, from your perspective, where you think the market is moving and what relevance this agreement has in the context of where, where you see the tuna market moving. Go ahead. Great. Thanks very much, Alice. And uh, it's a pleasure to be here today. Um, can everyone see the screen OK? Great stuff. So um, what I'm going to do is just give you the, the perspective of the Global Tuna Alliance on the new fisheries subsidy tax and really on sort of harmful subsidies in the round. So just a, um, a little bit of information about the Global Tuna Alliance. We, we're a group of retailers, food service companies, wholesalers and their suppliers of tuna who are working together to utilise our collective commercial power to change tuna fisheries for the better. And that's not just environmental sustainability, but it's things like traceability, transparency, and of course, social responsibility. And you can see our vision there, uh, very broad. We're trying to um, make sure that tuna meets the highest standards of environmental performance and social responsibility. So pretty ambitious aims. And of course, harmful subsidies comes into that. This is our membership. Um, you can see uh, probably recognize a number of the companies there, some very big companies, some of the, um, the biggest retailers in the world, plus some very significant suppliers of tuna. We're also represented in Africa with Woolworths, in the Western Pacific with Pacifical, North America with a couple of companies. Um, and we obviously have quite a base in Northwestern Europe, and that's not really surprising when you consider that Northwestern Europe and North America are probably the markets that are most advanced in terms of seafood sustainability. Um, what's the scale of our partners? You know, what, what is our commercial leverage? Now, we've tried to work this out by doing a, a, an analysis of our partners. And at the end of 2020, we did a survey to try to get some information. And the key bits of information I want to tell you is that our partners bought last year 1.27 million tonnes of tuna. To put that in perspective, that's about one fifth of the global production of tuna, 20 percent. And that was worth about one point three billion dollars. And so that's a significant amount of leverage of money that's going back into economies, back into the system. And these companies want to see that money being spent in a wise way. Where do we source from? We source from across the world. A lot of the places we saw some you can barely see on this map, tiny little islands, small island developing states um, who are significant producers of tuna, Mauritius, uh, the Maldives, Seychelles, Tuvalu, Vanuatu, etc. But you can see we're spread across the world in terms of where we source tuna from. So it is very much a global industry. So what is our interest in ending harmful subsidies? Why should the market care? Well, sustainable fishing. Um, the efforts there are being heavily outweighed by the impacts caused by harmful subsidies. And I don't I think I'm, I'm sure I don't need to say that, uh, but it's worth noting that the GTA, we are calling for governments to redirect taxpayers' money towards ocean biodiversity and tackling climate change instead of funding harmful fishing operations and essentially funding overfishing. Um, so positive subsidies, not a problem making sure that the ocean health is improved, making sure that overfishing is stopped. That's where we want to see um, the money's being put. 
the, the, the sort of the interest against our sort of strategic aims is that um, harmful subsidies undermines our efforts in other areas we're working in, uh, particularly social responsibility and transparency and traceability as well. So it's not just all about overfishing. So what is our view on the exemptions in the new, uh, the new text? Well, the text does have exemptions for fisheries that are not being managed. Um, and that, that's worrying us because we believe that only responsibly managed fisheries should qualify uh, for the exemptions. Otherwise, the impact of the agreement is really undermined. And it is a balance there as well between um, what fisheries want and what the marketplace wants. And this is the balance. Whoops, excuse me. Sorry, got uh, a little bit excited there. Um, the market is calling for sustainably managed fisheries. That's what they're looking for. They're looking for sustainably managed products. And if there are these exemptions for fisheries that aren't managed, there's going to be a limited appeal for that on the marketplace if that is where you are looking to put the tuna. If it's for internal markets, domestic consumption, for example, that are not interested in that area, then that's a different situation and we're aware of that. But we wanted to make it clear that the market is looking for sustainably managed products and positive exemptions can be used in a really constructive way. Uh, and this slide is demonstrating that, you know, anything we support positive subsidies that can lead to improved fish health and long-term sustainability. But we do urge caution that if there are unintended consequences uh, or loopholes in the text that can lead to exemptions that can um, end up with overfishing, that's going to be a negative step. So we just need to be really careful and mindful of that from our perspective. So going forward, sort of the take home message really is that some of our members are already thinking about adjusting where they buy tuna from based on subsidy related considerations. So they, are, they, want to, they want to be able to say to their customers and their stakeholders, their shareholders, where they're buying the tuna from and they wanna start considering the level of subsidies. So the transparency provisions in the text are really important and complying with them will make it much easier to access markets. If you can demonstrate um, where the subsidies are, what they are, where they're going to, that's going to be potentially a positive market attractor. Um, and finally, for the commercial fisheries, the value of any exemptions in the text will or should be limited by market demands for sustainably managed fish products. So this goes back to the, the balance between a harmful subsidy and a positive subsidy. So there are real pros and cons that you know, we urge people to consider. Thank you very much indeed for listening. It's great to have the opportunity. Very happy to speak to people afterwards. Um, there's my contact details. There's our website and very happy to continue a discussion. Thank you, Alice. I'm sorry, I wasn't unmuted myself. Thank you very much indeed, Tom. That was extremely interesting. Um, and again, I'm, I'm struck by the fact that this is the view of 20% of the market for tuna, which is one of the most valuable fisheries markets in the world. Um, and thanks also for underlining the importance of transparency, right? Because I think the transparency parts of treaties are often sort of ignored as the boring part where you have to notify to a committee, but actually highlighting as you have that well-crafted and well-implemented transparency rules in a treaty and a discussion of them and greater transparency about subsidies could actually be useful in helping countries to eventually access markets where subsidy provision becomes um, become, becomes a consideration for some for some sourcing companies. That's that's an important point and one that I don't think we've heard before. Um, so thank you for adding that in. Um, I guess with uh, with Sebastian uh, and with Tom, we've heard from. Some of the some part of the science uh, we've heard from part of the market important parts of the science and important parts of the market. Um, I thought I'd turn now perhaps to to Anna Hall because Anna is one of the one of the few but one of the one of the most dedicated um, of the environmental groups who's really followed the detail of this text uh, and I know that she's done it um, and provided views before. So Anna, you you've seen Monday's text. Um, can I invite you to share some specific views with those listening, please? Yes, sure. Thank you very much, Alice. And thanks to IISD for inviting me um, to make an intervention from WBF's perspective. I don't have any slides, 
but um, the NGOs <laughs> are working on a very detailed analysis and commentary of Monday's text. And we are aiming, we're working very hard on it right now <laughs> and aiming to send that to you um, by this weekend. So hopefully that very detailed analysis will be a good and more holistic follow-up of the, the very brief intervention that I will uh, make right now. Um, yeah, from a conservation perspective, there are certainly many, many good provisions um, on the table right now. Um, but a key concern, and, and, and Tom's alluded to that just now in his presentation as well, is that we may end up in a situation where too broad exemptions and flexibilities become big loopholes that render good prohibitions ineffective at worst. So we also believe that um, exceptions have to be kept limited and accompanied by strong sustainability commitments and conditions. I'll focus now on a few aspects in two key articles, Article 4 and 5, um, starting with Article 4 on overfished stocks. So this is uh, not really new to any of you at this point, but it's important to keep in mind that more than one third of assessed global fish stocks are already overexploited, and this number has been increasing over the past decades. A clear and simple prohibition on harmful subsidies applying to all overfished stocks is really what is needed from a sustainability and conservation perspective, and it is what Article 4.1 establishes. There should not be any exemption to this, but the agreement continues to foresee one in Article 4.3. So from a sustainability perspective, we are particularly concerned that as currently drafted, this article broadens the potential scope uh, of the flexibility with the introduction of the words and or measures in brackets. So allowing governments to provide harmful subsidy merely by showing that they have measures to promote the sustainability or the recovery of the stock would massively weaken the prohibition from our perspective as the stock is still overfished. And the provision of harmful subsidies heightens the risk that the effectiveness of any management measure really is undermined. If an exemption to the prohibition in 4.1 absolutely needs to stay and is included in Article 4.3, the bracketed wording and or measures should be eliminated as a minimum from our perspective. So we would propose essentially going back to the draft or the text agreement um, presented by the chair in May 2021. I think that was TN. Uh, 276, I think. Anyways, you know more, be better than I probably. <laughs> um, but it was presented in May, that version. Otherwise, really, the prohibition in Article 4 is largely meaningless, given the very broad nature of the flexibility that would trigger an exemption. On Chapter 5, on overfishing and overcapacity, this really has the great, greatest potential um, for significant impact in terms of um, long-term environmental, but also economic sustainability. But in turn, broad um, exemptions here risk undermining the level of ambition and the effectiveness of the overall agreement. Article 5 should really not be a marketplace for trading of exemptions rather than commitments. A key concern remains, from our perspective, the so-called sustainability test, the exemption in Article 5.11. Why? Well, the notification of management measures is not in itself evidence that a fishery faces a reduced threat of depletion. And the agreement would very likely leave it up to the individual member how to determine the biologically sustainable level of a fish stock meaning that this exemption could allow, worst case, members to continue to provide harmful capacity enhancing subsidies, even when stocks are at very low biomass levels. And that will not ensure long-term environmental and economic sustainability. A healthy stock should at the very least be the precondition for harmful subsidy payments, especially because this exemption in 5.11 now potentially has a very wide applicability, potentially even applying to fishing in areas beyond national jurisdiction and fishing by the distant water fleet. Which would also really be the next point that I wanted to highlight that concerns us massively from a conservation perspective. And that is the suggested um, move of former Article 5.2a related to dis distant water fishing under the umbrella of Article 5.1. 
This makes the prohibition subject to this exemption that I just mentioned, the exemption of article, uh, the exemption in Article 5.11, and to special and differential treatment. So the provision is now much less strict. Well, given the significant really ecological impact of fishing in uh, waters beyond national jurisdiction, where we have to remember that management is much weaker, it's crucial that the to the credibility of an overall WTO agreement to include a prohibition without exemption on subsidies to fishing um, activities in all areas beyond national jurisdiction, and especially including those subsidy programs that are specifically designed for distant water fishing. A prohibition um, of subsidies on fishing in ABNJ really should not be subject to any flexibilities or exceptions. Why is that? Because fishing in the high seas cannot really be subjected to a sustainability test since there is no comprehensive governance framework to the high seas that defines what would constitute sustainable fishing practices there nor do we really have a mechanism to perform proper environmental impact assessments that could determine the real impact of fisheries in areas beyond national jurisdiction, nor could cumulative impacts be measured. So to have a real sustainability test. With this in mind, um, it's important for us also to say that there is a good prohibition in Article 5.2, and it's important that it stays as it is because this um, prohibition relates to unregulated high seas. And here at a very minimum, um, no flexibilities should be allowed with respect to the provision of any harmful subsidies. Um, finally, and trying to be very brief, uh, some quick remarks on special and differential treatment. Overall, the scope there has been widened in the new draft text and a new concept has been introduced, the de minimis um, exemption in Article 5.4b1. Um, I should say, well, the, the objective criteria on the share of global marine capture production, the de minimis, is certainly welcomed, um, but we believe it should be more limited. We don't support any permanent exemptions as they hinder the transition to less harmful subsidies regi regimes in our view. Um, while the de minimis uh, exception could certainly provide a flexibility uh, to an important number of uh, developing countries, we would suggest and, and strongly encourage actually members to make it time bound just as Article 5.4a, so link it somehow to the time boundness of that uh, previous um, article. Um, also, we think that the de minimis threshold must be at most 0.7%, because we have to keep in mind that this would apply to all fishing by these countries. If an exception is to be agreed, it has to be conditional upon transparency, also important from our perspective, and to notification requirements in Article 8. And finally, to at least limit the risk that uh, subsidies um, are not contributing to overcapacity and overfishing, we very much welcome that the chair um, has introduced in um, paragraph 5.4c, uh, the uh, uh, if you want a best endeavor sustainability commitment. Um, we believe this is the bare minimum, but very welcome, particularly if some permanent exemptions are going to stay. Overall, um, anybody that has followed these negotiations of the past years, decades, knows that it is a huge step forward um, that the agreement text has evolved as much as it has. And trade-offs are inevitably part of this stage of the negotiations. However, while environmental NGOs also understand that the need to apply pragmatism to find um, multilateral consensus is really needed, especially with 164 members, there is a fine line between applying such pragmatism and simply cementing the status quo or at worst enabling a race to the bottom. So keeping exemptions limited and accompanied by robust notification and sustainability commitments is really crucial for the agreement to be able to contribute in the fight against global overfishing. Thank you very much. That's super, Anna. Thank you very much indeed. Um, and thank you for making your remarks so very 
tied to the text. Um, for those of you who might be watching this recording a bit later, um, I need a bit of a refresher on exactly where the text is. Um, feel free to refer to the recording that you'll also see um, where I walk through some of the, the articles of the new text so you can make sure you've got your 5.2s clear and your 5.3s. But Anna, thank you, that was extremely helpful. Um, and in fact, it's a useful lead in as we talk about uh, exceptions and the flexibilities required to um, Sebastian Matthew, uh, because Sebastian, you and I have been talking about sort of the various exceptions available and particularly the exceptions that there might be in the text for subsidies to continue to artisanal fisheries, um, about which you're one of the world's experts. So what do you think reading the text? Are we heading in the right direction? Um, what would you tell negotiators at this point? Go ahead. Yeah, thank you, Alice, uh, for inviting uh, ICSF uh, to this meeting. Uh, our perspective is uh, slightly different from the uh, previous speakers because we are mainly working with uh, small scale artisanal fishers in the developing world in particular. Uh, and we are mainly interested in the livelihood issue, uh, employment, income, food security issues. And, uh, and above all, the issue of uh, intergenerational equity. So from that point of view, we think that the conservation and sustainable use of uh, fisheries resources is very important. So, and then, uh, I mean, we have some concern about the fact that, uh, uh, you know, if you look at the fish production, you can see that uh, uh, some of the leading uh, fish producers are developing countries. If you take the top 10 countries, uh, five are developing countries. And then if you take the share of developing countries in, uh, in global capture fisheries, marine capture fisheries production, it's about two thirds are coming from the developing world. So therefore, they play a very important role, maybe very different from several other sectors. So therefore, I think uh, uh, they need to be more uh, uh, actively engaging with this uh, uh, negotiation uh, to reach a fruitful conclusion. Uh, because I, I noticed that already we have spent 21 years but if you look at the Uruguay round and uh, even law of the sea convention, you can see that Uruguay round maybe seven years, seven and a half years and law of the sea convention took nine years to conclude. So this is really a matter of concern that even after 21, I mean, we are nearing 21 years after the Doha round negotiations. So therefore high time to reach a conclusion. So that is, uh, I think it's in the larger interest of uh, conservation and sustainable use. Um, and then if you come to artisanal and small scale fishers, I mean, I, I noticed that uh, there is a reference to low income resource poor and livelihood fishing used as a proxy uh, for small scale uh, artisanal and small scale fisheries. So therefore, if I, if I take that as a, as a presumption, then one can say that, you know, they are very important uh, sector. When they contribute maybe about uh, one third to about half of uh, global marine fish catches. So they have significant fish producers in the world. They're not marginal fish producers. They are very large contributors. And they operate a range of uh, fishing gear uh, from uh, stationary gear to towed and known towed fishing gear. And they operate from shorelines to uh, baselines and from baselines to the territorial sea and from the territorial sea to the east. So you can see that they spread over from the uh, shoreline to the east and therefore we have to see that they have a fairly uh, important footprint. So therefore we need to see how do you want to scope that footprint vis-a-vis -vis, uh, fisheries issues. Uh, and then uh, when it comes to the issue of overfishing and overcapacity pillar in the new text, uh, and especially when it comes to uh, special and differential treatment uh, provisions for artisanal and small scale fishing vessels, um, I think uh, uh, these uh, provisions uh, uh, should apply to uh, not only fishing in the territorial waters, but also to the EZ, because as I said, they are fishing all over, but then uh, there can be a transition period, uh, which probably maybe eight years to, you know, uh, uh, remove overcapacity and overfishing, uh, and because already so many years have been spent nego negotiating and many countries are developing national instruments, so therefore, building upon what we have achieved in light of the negotiation and the leverage effect of WTO, we can say that maybe eight years we can do after the agreement reaches a conclusion uh, uh, as a transition period. And of course, after that, uh, I mean, I believe that 5.1.1 is a very good incentive for countries to think about, uh, you know, 
managing their resources uh, while in some situation, in political situation or in some other livelihood related situation, they have to provide some subsidies. But then conservation management have to be the bottom line of any attempt to include, introduce subsidies. And then, uh, 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 so when you talk about uh, the, the so-called low income resource poor and uh, livelihood fishing, and I think, uh, uh, there is need to maybe uh, kind of uh, make the scope a little narrow. So therefore, my suggestion is that to see the non toad categories as the, 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 the key uh, kind of uh, sec sections of uh, low income food, uh, low income fishers that we are trying to protect using this kind of SNDT provisions. So, uh, and within that, uh, therefore, we should have focus on those employing, uh, not employing destructive fishing here like bottom trawls, because uh, small scale fisheries in many national contexts also include bottom trawling. So we would like to exclude uh, destructive type of fishing from the scope of uh, low income resource poor and uh, livelihood fishing. So therefore that's very important for negotiators to consider. And then uh, uh, when you talk about uh, a transition period, I think under the four, I think Anna talked about earlier, over fish stocks, I think that uh, no, I also share the concerns of a worldwide fund vis-a-vis -vis Article 4 language. I think there, I think the SNDT clause, maybe uh, the uh, transition period can be kept at two years so, so for the, for the uh, uh, developing world and not to have you know very broad uh, kind of transition period. So that may be uh, something uh, one can live with. And uh, 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 finally, I think it's a matter of some concern that you know costs of personnel, social charges, and income support of workers are listed uh, under 5.1 as uh, subsidies uh, contributing to overcapacity and overfishing because these are social benefits we notice that. But then uh, again, going back to 5.1.1, we think that uh, the fishers unions, for example, fishers unions have to play an active role in resource management. I think right now there's so much into uh, into uh, uh, production and marketing, but not sufficiently investing the resources in resource management. So from an intergenerational equity point of view, I think the fisheries cooperatives and unions have to take a very active interest in resource management. And therefore, uh, I would uh, support it being there, but at the same time, 5.1.1 uh, can be used by the unions to, to uh, prevail upon the uh, owners of fishing vessels operators to, to cooperate uh, in maintaining uh, fish stocks at a biologically sustainable level. Yeah. So these are the you know, key points I would like to contribute to this discussion. Yeah, thank you. Sebastian, thank you. That was extremely rich and helpful. Um, so we're talking about, as you said, kind of the range of gears and geographies that if there was, you know, from your perspective, extending the, extending the exemption geographically beyond 12 nautical miles might make sense. But that may, but it might also make sense to make that extension, sorry, to make that exemption temporary. Right, limited to a transition period of eight years, essentially to bring artisanal fishers into the management regimes that will apply to everything else. That's an interesting idea. Um, and the idea of non-toed uh, gear is an extremely interesting one, and it's perhaps a specific exemption for destructive fishing gear. Um, if we have some time in the discussion, I might come back and ask you exactly what that means, because other people may have the question too. Um, and then again, I think the, the balance of in either excluding income support or in the list of, of the prohibition or including it, but encouraging fishers associations to focus on ensuring that the 511 sustainability requirement is met in order to allow some of these subsidies to continue is a useful dynamic, right? And one that um, I suspect, you know, Tom Pickrell's probably happy to hear because that means more involvement from local communities in ensuring that all of the fish, in his case, tuna, um, that his members are interested in buying is sustainable. So that's all super helpful, Sebastian, thank you. Um, last, but very, very certainly not least, um, Enrique, I mean, you have a, a perspective on artisanal fishing, but from the other side of the planet from Sebastian. So from India to Mexico, Enrique, how do you read this text? What do you think? Thank you, Alice. I, I think it's, we are moving forward after 21 years. And I think there are interesting things for, for, for the case of, of small scale fisheries. So just introducing myself, I'm a director of a small NGO of small scale fishermen, and I have worked all my life with small scale fisheries. And I, I'm kind of, of surprised when, when listening Anna, Tom, 
and Sebastian how at this moment industrial fishing academics and conservation we have a lot of points in common and 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 and, and it's ending this this overfishing and and ending the subsidies to other fishing so what i have to say from the perspective of small scale fishermen it's that they're happy about receiving subsidies but they know these subsidies are not solving their problems and talking with some of them they have some of them already have noticed that these subsidies that they receive happily are creating more problems than the ones they are solving because they are receiving some funds for fuel. That fuel is giving also funds for other fishers to go out and they are finding every day in their lives less and smaller fish. So in that circumstances, not all, but some of them and a good bunch of them are noticing that these subsidies are harming them. They will receive it, of course, but they but they are noticing this is not helping. This is not helping them, uh, and this is turning in kind of a poverty trap. They request more subsidies because they have less fish and less sizes, and there are more fish there, uh, less stocks there, and at that moment they are fishing less, and this is turning into a circle, a kind of poverty trap in the community. Uh, and also, so when thinking and, sub and giving subsidies to small-scale fishers with very good intentions, policymakers think they are benefiting the small-scale fishers. But when you have a lot of people fishing, the local prices in the in the fishing towns go down. So the the final benefit of that small scale small scale uh, of that subsidies to small-scale fisheries is a benefit that the intermediaries, that the big companies that buy and sell fish are benefiting from that subsidy, not the communities. Because the communities with a lot of fish they are taking, they lower the prices, and the final people that is getting that benefit is the big company that it's buying and selling, not the small scale fish. So I don't doubt about the good intentions of the policy making, but it is not working in the community. Uh, so maintaining the subsidies as they are, it's not sustainable. We have to get rid of these subsidies and we have to do it fast. In 2001, when we start these negotiations in the Doha round, 25% of the fish stocks in the world have potential to be developed. One quarter, 25% in the Doha round. We have been discussing this for 21 years and today, only 6% of the fish stocks can be developed. We, are, we lose super valuable time. So we have to do it fast because we are affecting these people. Another important fact is that only five participants are giving 58% of the subsidies worldwide. So we're not, so these subsidies are not been giving benefits to the world entirely. It's, it's just a few of them. So, so we are not getting there. And, and the other super important fact is that regardless of several rules and things that we're proposing, at the end, 84% of the global subsidies are being received by the industries, not by the small scale fish. So most of the speech saying, okay, we want to give subsidies for the people, for the fishermen, it's not really there. 85% it's in the industrial, in the industrial fleet. So, 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 so we have to get rid of these, of these of these subsidies and we have to do it fast. However, working with fishermen and being in, 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 the, in the fishing communities all my working life, let me know that doing that at once, saying since tomorrow we will not give subsidies, it's kind of risky and probably not feasible for some communities. And, and I read and I understand that. And, and if, I, if in this moment I go to the fishermen with I, which I work as a Oh, for, since tomorrow there will not be subsidies, that will be drastic and kind of difficult and probably impossible. For us. And what I like most of these texts, and, and, and it, it was also in the previous text, is in Article 5.4a, the transition period. I think the transition period is a, an essential point for, for these negotiations and for moving forward. At the end, we need to get rid of exemptions but the transition period would make it feasible for the communities 
and acceptable in policy terms and in social terms. So I, I think I, I, I'm from Mexico, and in Mexico we have kind of a, a success example of a transition period. It has been super long. It started in, two, in 2006 when the, the fuel subsidy was fixed instead of the, as a percentage, it was fixed as, as, as 0 0.1 dollars per liter. So, so when fixing that in that way, the, 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 fuels, the fuel prices naturally start increasing. And in 2006, that represents 60% of the price of the fuel. In 2020, when the, when, the, when the fuel subsidies were eliminated in Mexico, that subsidy was representing less than 10%. Than 10 so the way it was fixed that way, not, not a lump sum way, but a direct subsidy, make the cal that transition period, would make the, infl the, the inflation mark the transition period. And, it, and I think it was smart. It was slow, but it was smart. It was the successful part. But when Mexico was super unsuccessful, was in phasing in good subsidies. They were good phasing out that subsidies, but they failed on phasing in the, the, the positive subsidies. So today we have huge IUU problems and some studies are saying that for each vessel, we have another vessel that for, for, from, for each legal vessel, we have another illegal vessel. So the, the, the fishing effort in Mexico, it's twice the official fishing effort. So, so that, that's, that's, that's super complicated and, and that could be solved it only by, by probably putting more, more money in, in, in facing IUU. And also we have such a lot of, of, of gaps in, in research and sustainability. So I think the idea in 5.4a of putting a, 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 a date, a limit date is good, but we probably in, in these last weeks, days of negotiation, we can talk more about uh, about these transition periods. And I, I think I'm taking all my time. I think this, and I have some numbers also here, but uh, but what I want to say is that for the case, and it's only talking about the, the economic exclusive zones, for the case of fisheries beyond the national jurisdiction, I believe there's no need for transition periods. I think we have to, to apply the, the, the prohibitions and apply that once and apply it fast. Just, just, just a, a small example. For the FAO zone 41, that it's Brazil, Uruguay, and Argentina, more than there are more than, than $50 million in subsidies in that region, in, 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 the, in the region 41. And of that, and of those 50 million subsidies, 91% is delivered by China, China, Taipei, Korea, and Spain. It's not delivered by Brazil or, or, or Uruguay or Argentina. It's from, it's from other countries that are super far from there. So so and are, and are affecting, of course, the local fisheries in, in, in that region 41. So, so those numbers, I think, are super important for saying uh, for areas beyond national jurisdiction, probably we have to apply these, these at once. And in the case of RFMOs, uh, probably a calendar will work, but, but it should be faster than in the EEC. So, so in general, my, my, my comment is that this calendar idea, it's, it's super good and not also for getting rid of subsidies but also for transparency and for cooperation. Having a good face-out, face-in calendar, it's also a great opportunity for strengthening collaboration and increasing transparency. And I think I, I take more than my time, but thank you very much. No, thank you very much, Enrique. Um, and in fact, if I can just to, to pull up that last point you were making about a transition period, and perhaps and sort of learning from the experience of having the negative subsidies withdrawn but not reinvested in a positive way um i'm not suggesting that we write that into the treaty because that would be a whole other 20-year discussion um but it, perhaps it's something for governments to think about right i mean if as we say we as it looks like there may be there's a transition period for subsidies away from non -art, at least non-artisanal fishing in the ezs um it's an, it's an interesting question for governments where does that money then go Right. If you are beginning, even if, if the you know a detaxation process, if you are beginning to apply tax where you didn't before, how are you going to spend that tax? You know, if we're looking for money to improve fisheries management, this would seem to be an obvious source, right? And then, in fact, you make the further subsidy reform hopefully easier, 
Um, and of course, you make it more likely that you'll, you'll be able to use 5.1.1 once the transition period expires. So I think there's, there's some interesting virtuous loops that we could perhaps be encouraging policymakers to think about in addition to those on the call. Um, we do have a little bit of time for, for questions and comments. If anyone has any, feel free to either put your hand up if you'd like to take the floor or write them in the Q&A if you're feeling a bit shy, that's fine too. Um, and while